so uh, I would like to uh, note that uh, we are the session is a public forum so we have around uh, 15 to 20 people online joining us today and uh, uh, we we would like to prior to commencing I would like to do a small introduction about uh, today's program Yeah, and uh, we would like to uh, uh, we would like to do an introductory video about the Sri Lanka Innovators Forum. The Sri Lanka Innovators Forum (SLIF) is an initiative of the Gambini Korea Foundation aimed at meaningfully contributing towards resolving the complex economic issues confronting the country today. The Gamini Korea Foundation was founded to take forward the passion of Dr. Gamini Korea to achieve just and equitable economic development in all countries. The late Dr. Gamini Korea was an international renowned Sri Lankan economist and an outstanding product of the universities of Cambridge and Oxford. Born on the 4th of November 1925 to Dr. C.V.S. Correa and Freda Correa, sister of Sir John Kothalavala, the then Prime Minister of Ceylon. Dr. Gamni Correa's grandfather and grand uncle were the famous freedom fighters from Chilo, Victor Correa, who was a member of the Legislative Council of Ceylon, and Charles Correa. His uncle, Sir Claude Correa, was as at the forefront of Sri Lanka's entry onto the world stage at the independence and for many years thereafter. Gamini Correa was educated at the Royal College Colombo, after which he started his higher education at the University of Ceylon in 1944 before going to study at Corpus Christi College, Cambridge and Nuffield College, Oxford from 1945 to 52. There he obtained two BAs and MAs from the University of Oxford and the University of Cambridge and a DPhil from the University of Oxford. He was the first Sri Lankan to obtain a doctorate in economics. He was also the first Sri Lankan to obtain a doctorate from Oxford University in any subject. He was a key member of the planning committee for Sri Lanka's first 10-year plan, 1959, which sought to raise economic growth and reduce poverty. Among his numerous achievements was his appointment as a Secretary General of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development where he negotiated the terms of the Loam Convention, a landmark agreement providing development and access to European markets to Africa and the Caribbean. He was an early proponent of the equitable development who worked tirelessly for trade and development in developing countries. The Gamini Korea Foundation provides opportunities for meaningful economic engagement through rigorous multidisciplinary research to promote inclusive and sustainable development. The Gamini Korea Foundation, an autonomous non-profit institution, is committed to making a real and lasting difference in the lives of vulnerable people. The Sri Lanka Innovators Forum, SLIF, has been conceptualized by Gamini Korea Foundation to bring about change and infuse innovation into the processes of democratic governance and sustainable economic development. It aims to pursue in-depth research and dialogue focusing on core sectors that need to be addressed and suggest innovative, results-oriented policy strategies to resolve the current economic crisis. The Sri Lanka Innovators Forum will bring together the like-minded thought leaders and industry stakeholders to discuss, debate and agree on pressing issues in a variety of sectors and devise alternative, sustainable economic models, processes and practices. A group of thought leaders who are also subject experts have been assigned to review the issues papers and provide necessary guidance and relevant research material to the respective authors. SLIF will transcend boundaries and barriers and invite specialists from all over the world to contribute their expert views and knowledge to enable Sri Lanka to face its current challenges effectively. 20 identified sectors have been assigned to experts to research and write issues papers on contemporary issues which have an impact on socio-economic development. The discourse will commence with questions that should be raised on good governance and administrative reforms. The other topics are tourism, export-oriented industrial development, macroeconomic policy, poverty reduction, reforming Sri Lanka state-oriented enterprises, Sri Lanka's electricity and petroleum industry, Sri Lankan food crops, livestock and fisheries, transportation and highways, education, healthcare, shipping and logistics, 
international trade and investment, sub-national policies, environment, women and development, ethnicity and socio-economic development, information technology and foreign policy. The outcome of these issues papers forms a blueprint to be presented to policymakers as a landmark contribution from the Garmini Korea Foundation towards strengthening the economic recovery of Sri Lanka. You are invited to join the Sri Lanka Innovators Forum by logging on to the Garmini Korea website. Fill in the registration form, choose an area of expertise where you would like to share your knowledge, advice and comments on the issues papers posted under each thematic area. Sri Lanka Innovators Forum Beyond the Barriers of Tradition Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to invite the Deputy Chairman of the Garmini Korea Foundation, Dr. Harsha Atharupanit, to give the welcome speech. On behalf of the Garmini Korea Foundation, uh, let me extend a warm welcome to our speaker, Dr. R.M.K. Ratnayaka, the chairman of the session, Mr. Chandrasena Maliyadda, and the three eminent panelists who have come, as well as the members of the audience, and all those who have come in on, uh, on an internet link. Uh, this session, as you uh, would have heard, is part of the Sri Lanka Innovators Forum, and this is the third item in the session. We have had two... Uh, Events, in, events before this, one on the macroeconomy and one on, the, on foreign affairs. And this is the third on a very important topic uh, on poverty reduction and poverty alleviation. And we hope after each of these events to publish the paper that has been prepared based on the comments that are pr uh, provided by the panelists and the members of the audience. And these will be available in a series that will be published by the Garmini Korea Foundation. I think currently the macroeconomic paper and the foreign affairs paper is being prepared for publication. And then Dr. Ratnaika will finalize this paper after today's event. And it will be available. Uh, so let me proceed now by inviting the chairman of this session, Mr. Chandrasena Maliyadda, to take over and invite our speaker. Wherever, you can do it from there. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, now, according to many reports, the poor or near poor population is more or less 50 percent of the total population. That means today we are discussing about the majority of the people, the poverty, poor people, poverty. So this is a very interesting topic and also it is very important and timely and uh, there have been several poverty alleviation, pro different types of poverty alleviation programs implemented in this country since independence and uh, Dr. Ratnayaka is a pioneer may researcher in poverty elevation and also he has been involved and responsible for implementation of several poverty elevation programs. Even now he is involved in this matters related to poverty elevation. So as uh, Dr. Harshad Rupan said, uh, we have uh, Dr. Ratnayaka will make the presentation and then three eminent panelists. They are very shy. They have given me a very brief uh, bio data. Dr. Ratnayaka has given me one. but. I don't want to read it out because I don't want to eat into Dr. Ratnayaka's uh, time. Uh, he was one time uh, secretary to several ministries and now he's an adjunct professor, associate professor, professor emeritus, professor, so many things are there. So I am not going to read out the list to may save your time, and, but I will invite Dr. Ratnayaka to make his presentation on the poverty elevation. Thank you, Mr. Maliyadda, uh, ladies and gentlemen. This is, of course, uh, is an important issue. It's a nationally important issue. And uh, I will try to take you, uh, not through the text, but I will 
summarize what is there and uh, I will take up some of the issues for discussion and uh, see how best that we could uh, move forward. What is really required is uh, 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 very formidable action plan. Uh, we were doing this for last so many years, but uh, we can't say if we fail, but uh, the success rate is quite uh, not quite sufficient. Uh, reasons are many. I will take you through some of these things and see how best we could uh, look at the problem and what the problem looks like and what's the way out. That's the idea of uh, having this workshop. And uh, I will organize, I want to organize my presentation on basically on issues, on definitions, uh, understanding the cause of poverty. Uh, important thing is now it's getting more philosophical also. Uh, it had been there throughout, but recently the failure of justice, that is uh, equality of opportunities, uh, though we are uh, spending most of our money for public service, whether we are <clears throat> able, we were able to uh, distribute these resources equitably. Then uh, you have, a, like any subjects, because economics have taken over by the mathematicians and the physicists,
and down was so this one the promise is for only 3 years every 3 years they do a survey you can't do it every every year because it's too costly once in 3 years they do a survey and if they find that uh, they are better off they'll move they'll be moved out if they are not they'll be staying probably for another round but one need to find out why they have not success uh, that that all depends on the economic growth of the country expansion i mean poverty is something if you mo want to move out of if we want to move a people or family out of poverty there are a number of ways to do that you have to increase their income through employment or through engage them in a gainful production activity there's no other way so those if the economy is not moving forward and the economy is not growing fast you can't find employment because if you look at the after uh, the covid uh, the labor force participation has declined somewhat especially among women and also you would have seen that uh, the, the, their preferred job at least for the time being with the government some of the government fa government factories are shutting down in rural areas not all but you see now where are the new employments are coming those are the issues that we need to look at not nail the numbers the numbers of course says that uh, we this is also useful for you to see in 2002 we have had count uh, poverty index of 22.7 that is about quarter of population below poverty uh, that is uh, we mostly eliminate the uh, extreme poverty that is 1.9 dollar 1.9 dollar a day uh, it is almost eliminated in this country and unfortunately currently it's about 25% those are the guess guess work not the real numbers we need to wait till the income and expenditure survey results move come and we we assume as uh, ms chandra sena said vulnerability and uh, food uh, insecurity can go up to as much as 50% of the population and there's a seasonality effect because we have seen wfp and various other reports coming saying that most of the people do not have enough food to eat that happens in a dry zone dry period now when the rain comes you have a lot of uh, other food crops available in this country uh, they are even the poor and uh, other people can pick those things you see we in nutrition we divide the year into two seasons feasting and fasting feasting season comes in our country somewhere in april that is what the we say aurudu and all that is after harvesting and the dry season actually uh, beginning of the rainy season start in october november till january that's the worst period in this country if you look at the uh, health statistics especially anemia in the dry zone because uh, those th that period you have more episodes of diarrhea and various things among children and anemia among uh, mothers largely i mean you don't go and check it no you check it uh, if you are uh, if you are pregnant or something so when you checked it all the health institutions recorded that and then and the end result the low birth weights are rising we 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 as a as a general level we have about 15% low birth weights so for the last 30 40 years it's not changing we stag uh, stagnant at uh, stagnated at about 15 so when somebody says malnutrition is 18 it's normal to me because when you have low birth weight of about 15 I mean we talk much but it is also uh, this is visible in um, colombo hospitals so the, these are the numbers that comes out and you could see the the changes that taking place now with the the economic crisis in uh, 2023 these are world bank estimates and there are a number of other things are coming it's about 25 percent that, that is uh, us dollar 250 if you take that as a per, per day income this is what we looked at and this is uh, pretty serious because in 2002 we had 22 percent of the population and uh, 20 years later 
we still have 25, but this is of course, as we all know, the reasons are known. It's not the normal thing. There are other things. Now, this is of course, you can see the income distribution of the population. Income distribution change over time. Different groups get different income, and then uh, you can see the uh, changes that takes place. Uh, especially, we don't know what happened since 2019, 2020. We need to get that. I think it, it may be uh, much uh, sharper than this. And these are some of the things that we need, we cannot avoid, and this is uh, what we could see in the data. And if you look at the numbers, you could see uh, less than 18,500. Mean income is, uh, was uh, 11,692. Median income was 12,303. Basically, uh, it, it's very difficult for us to see how these people are surviving. But of course, there's a the interesting work uh, done by uh, Banerjee uh, and Daflo, they got the Nobel Prize a couple of years back, and they said they have a pretty interesting uh, patterns of survival in uh, among, power, among the poor, and uh, what we are guessing and what we are thinking is not the way that they are working and their, their habits. So what he basically felt was that we fail to understand the problems that they are encountering and the way they are living. So this is one of the criticisms that he is having. And uh, what they do right now is uh, giving small assistance, I'll come to that, uh, to people who are poor to change their income a little bit and they think that they, are, they can move forward easily. And this is also the uh, losses that uh, if, if you want to have a certain level of uh, consumption, the def defici deficits are fairly large in uh, these various desires. So these are, of course, all academic things that we do. Um, uh, the national poverty line the before COVID, it was 4.1% of Sri Lanka, that's 2017, uh, were considered as uh, poor. And we were actually moving forward very well. But then suddenly this came and the, uh, the economic debacle. And uh, we, we actually, in the, e even in uh, Samurdi, we have classified poor under four categories. Extreme poor, poor, less poor, and poor who are in transition. So <coughs> those poor who are in transition are earning $5.50 or less per day, uh, if you take the total population, it's about 42%, as Mali had said, 50% is somewhere there. So these are, if you work out in rupee terms, they are fairly high now. Uh, then, of course, the issue of vulnerability. Vulnerability is, uh, you can, uh, due to some other unknown, unrelated uh, reasons, you can immediately fall into poverty. Uh, that's of no your, uh, of, you, you, you are not responsible for that, but then the consequences uh, that you have to uh, look at. So but the other thing, basically what we need to do is we need to look at the aspect of vulnerability also. And uh, I don't think we need to do all this. Then we have a, a issue of, as I said, uh, how to select the poor. You see now, these, this is something we, the people attempted for many years. Uh, in the world, uh, the, in 18th, uh, 19th century, Rowan Tree in Glasgow, he wanted to assess uh, the poverty of uh, people in Glasgow. And uh, he asked one of the nutritionists at the time to uh, look at the, calculate the consumption patterns of the prisoners in the Glasgow prison. They are, they, 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 issue was that they were surviving. If they are surviving, that food must be good. So the caloric value of that and the monetary value of that food. So that was the poverty line initially they uh, prepared at that time, that is in 1899. 
and Rohendri had done so much of work in that area. Then, uh, reasons uh, in 1960s, Orshansky in the U.S. food stamps system worked out a very, very comprehensive statistical system to assess the people who should uh, be who should receive the food stamps under the U.S. system. Of course, there are uh, there are records that you can find in that system, unlike ours. Our, our people always won't give the right uh, information, therefore we cannot do that. We have to always, most of the time, we have to, we need to work on the proxies. Direct information is very poor and also you can't rely on that. On that basis, we have actually developed uh, three indicators. One is using the census data, uh, poverty headcount ratio, this is of course again with the World Bank. Uh, census Department had developed it for a longer period of time. Vimal Nanayakar was the pioneering person who was helping us, and thereafter it was institutionalized in that department. Then uh, again, uh, using the uh, other technologies, a proxy means test again helped by the World Bank. Uh, we actually using again the census data, did two or three exercises, to, un, un, uh, to classify and uh, place the poor and to select the numbers. Uh, but that, that was very good but never implemented because that's only a theoretical thing. The, the latest one is the multidimensional poverty index that was developed by the Oxford group of people and that is being uh, used in many countries to uh, identify the poor and the poverty and we are also using it. it. It looks it's very useful. I mean, I will mm -hmm. tell something about that later. Uh, now, this is, these are the, the indicators of that, indi the, the, uh, the multidimensional poverty indices. You have some indications, uh, some indicators from health, education, and standard of living. Instead of asking your money value, you are looking at various other things. So uh, health, nutrition, and child mortality. Child mortality is very low in our country. Uh, then you have education indicators and standard of li living, where we collect information of cooking fuel, electricity, housing, assets, uh, drinking water, and sanitation. They are very, they are highly correlating with poverty. There's an argument recently it's very easy to use electricity. Yes, it is. We are, we are having it here. And I'm not, of course, defending the system. I work this one with the census department and we field tested. It comes very nicely and you can easily uh, identify 95% of the people who fall under that high input poverty. And you can uh, check those households we, which we did. We did that in the five divisional secretariats and results were very good. And this is the one that, of course, people will come out and say that uh, something is missing and so on. We can build on this. It's a very good indicator because not, not one thing. I mean, what is more important is if you don't have a well uh, in a rural area, protected well, obviously you are much poorer than those who are having a protected well. If you share a toilet, again, that comes under that category. So we did a lot of uh, statistical tests. Uh, these are pooling, pooled uh, variables and got good results. And then we visited those households again to see which, which actually uh, are very credible. So it looks that this, is a, this way we can select the poor very well. If you, then you need to, you just can't, uh, you, these are the variables you have. Now, for each of the variables, you have a give a weight. What is more important? That, of course, uh, on base, two basic things, uh, your prior knowledge on the subject and also looking at the field surveys and the work that we have done in the past. So you can see a uh, number of variables here given uh, and uh, the specific weights. The maximum weight given was four. The minimum was uh, 1.8 or something. So these, uh, you, you, whatever the numbers that you get, you multiply these weights 
to get the uh, actual indicator. When you get it, you can see map out. There are certain indicators only rich can have. For instance, uh, lighting, uh, uh, then uh, the meals. Meal poor, poor is that uh, you are not in short of your general meal supply. When you, uh, the, the non-poor is in red and they have no problem in many of these indicators. But when you come to uh, the poor, you, you can see these, uh, they don't have animal, they don't have land, either highland or lowland. Uh, then uh, you, have, you don't have a very high income. You have few clothes, your expenditure is low. So you don't have vehicle. Few people are having a couple of things like a bicycle or something. But the, when you get these uh, indicators, you can separate out those who are having resources with those who are not having resources. It's easy. And uh, you see, you can't contest on those things. Um, otherwise, I uh, might, might say that my income is less and so on. So then um, the, they, are, they have been excised by the census department. And census found that uh, intensity of poverty indicates that each poor person is on average deprived in 41.6% of weighted indicators. I mean, they don't have many things. For instance, uh, we didn't uh, move into that far. One of the indicators that you, you can look into, if there's an under five child, if there are three children in that house, uh, a ch child with one and a half years is taken care of by the child who is uh, five years. Mother used to go to work, father used to go to work, that the uh, the base, the person who is looking after the two siblings were the child who is five years old. So that is a high indicator of poverty in that sense, but we don't, we didn't use that, but these are uh, too sophisticated at this point of time. And one important issue is the state sector. We have neglected this all the time in uh, welfare programs because of the assumption that they get a salary. Many of the people are working in the state and therefore they can have their own uh, income. But now th they too are aging and many of the people who are old in old age are not getting anything from the state because they once they have their EPF, ETF, that's it. And there are young people, educated boys, not much of girls. Girls used to come to Colombo and work in various places, but boys tend to stay. And uh, for those families, if the parents are old, there's no income. So we, as a policy, we didn't move into, now under this system, we need to move into the state sector. That is something, can have uh, some political debate on that. But uh, equality, and if it is welfare, that need to be done. So state areas also, poverty is very high. That we knew for a long, long period, but that poverty is getting more prominent when you use the multidimensional uh, indicators because their housing are low, they, they have not good, no, water services are less, and in this country, mat the maternal mortal is high, highest in the state sector, so as the child malnutrition. We average it out and find out the, the indicate that, I mean, our infant mortality is better than the Washington DC numbers. It's about 9% per 1,000 uh, live births. But if you go to state sector, it's about 30%. Uh, maternal mortality also is high. So those are the things that we need to look into. It's, uh, we can separate out and identify this in the rural areas. Now this is the scheme that government is uh, proposing as as I said. I think these numbers are right because we, we always were the view that we didn't have a serious poverty of mo not more than 1.2 million people. Now we have 2 million. That mm -hmm. is uh, less poor and transient poor. So th that uh, is uh, something easy for people to consider uh, in the intervention. And also, this, this you might surprise a little bit uh, disabled and receiving uh, renal support and elderly. 
you see what I happened. Uh, the government was paying money uh, for the people. World Bank is, I, su I suppose, World Bank and some other were given the money to the government, and the money that was given, uh, they 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 couldn't pay. They the reason being that these people are getting. You can pay only one person under one scheme. The, then you have to get that identity card number. Once you get the identity card number, there are families, uh, one person is getting benefits under four programs, which you cannot do. I mean, if you are getting one program, if that is not enough, that has to be increased. So those are one, one uh, the, as a result, what happened was that money had to be returned to the treasury. So they found it very difficult to reconcile. So then only they realized that these numbers are wrong and therefore the new numbers have to be, I, I suppose these, these are in order. So this is uh, large sums of money government is going to spend on this. This the poorest of the poor, uh, no transitional beneficiaries till 31st December 23, I'm sure that will go up to 24, that's my uh, thinking. This is costing six billion. Then 400,000 vulnerable beneficiaries, 5,000 monthly, uh, 31st March, 24, 18 billion. 800,000 poor beneficiaries, 8,500 cost 245 billion. 400,000 extremely poor beneficiaries, 15,216 billion. You see, you can see these numbers and the gravity of the problem. IVMF will never agree to these numbers if the problem is not that bad. I mean, it's worse, and therefore they actually agree to these numbers. Uh, they, when uh, the actual numbers, this, the payment of um, 15,000 and 8,500 was uh, uh, proposed number of times by the World Bank poverty assessment, because what you get is 3,000 rupees, that is only sufficient for a poorest man family to survive for 12 days of a month. Now with the inflation and so on, maybe about 15 days a month, but that is, that is some concession for those families. So I will stop there. The functional de de definition, as I said, you see, the Banerjee and others say that we actually fail to understand who these poor are and we used to uh, define the poverty using the, uh, uh, the old economics, that is what he says. And uh, if you look at the real situation, the real situation is different than what they are describing. Then uh, it is a number of arguments and th these are very good things to look at. Now what they say is basically if you want to move forward, uh, it's basically on, you, if you want to invest something, you invest on results-based approach because if it is, if something is not happening, don't put that money into that place. For instance, uh, I have seen a journal published by the, uh, the IDS, Institute of Development Studies, Sussex. A cover photo is a uh, uh, goat with a, uh, with a cap, that is uh, the graduation cap. The program is called graduation. What they do is they give a goat to those people, Africa as well as India and Bangladesh. Since we are sophisticated, we can't stop with one goat. Perhaps we have to give four or five. No, they, you see what, what is, what they basically say is they cannot handle a lot of money, but you allow them to improve a little bit. So from there they move forward. If you try to give a very large loan, like what we are doing, they cannot manage that. And also what is more important is you have to push them uh, to use that money. It's called the, 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 the strength of the leverage that is pushing is the uh, is the important thing for people to move forward. We use a single term called Vattam. It's coming in the social mobilization thing. So in this, uh, in this model that MIT, is, the JPAL, is proposing, which we have not because of uh, them, this has been uh, successfully tested in Bangladesh and also in India and few countries in Africa, and we also thought of doing it. There are four 
components in it, social protection, that is what the one that we are giving in money terms, then livelihood promotion. Livelihood promotion is you have to improve the, their, uh, their capabilities uh, to do something. Otherwise, you, see, you just give money, won't do any good. Then financial inclusion, because some of these people do not know how to use money. If you, that's, a, that's where the, the microcredit uh, problem came in. If somebody says, uh, buy this television, it's, it's not that uh, expensive. You have to pay 50 rupees a day. They just take it. They don't know how to collect 50 rupees every day for next three years. So they, they then uh, uh, they cannot repay. That man comes and uh, not only they take not only the television, they take the chairs or something in that house because the interest, uh, not only television, then you have various other things. So then people come to the government and say, uh, cancel this, don't allow them to come back. This is one of the problems. These are social problems that we need to deal with. That is where the financial inclusion comes. Then the social empowerment. So you must tell people, don't do these things, educate them. I mean, there should be a social movement. Earlier, we had so many things. I mean, we, the government had an institution called Rural Development Center, specifically looking at these sort of things. They were successful at once, but then with the sophistication, move, move, we move out of those uh, <coughs> arrangements. Uh, I, I don't want to get into these things, these uh, concepts of uti utilitarianism and uh, liberal, liberal, liber uh, libertarians. You see, some people say, don't tax uh, our money and give it to poor because uh, we will give that as a charity. But others say, look, you see, you, you earn money. Uh, there's a social problem here in the situation. Therefore, you have to may pay money. The argument in this country as well now, I have seen in the debates that uh, rich are not taxed adequately. Rich are taxed, but not adequately. But uh, poor and the middle class, not poor, the middle class who are public service and various others uh, getting uh, monthly salaries are taxed. So whether, I, I haven't seen a debate, but uh, except the university teachers going and meeting the president, uh, that is something that they have to debate. Either I don't know how to spend my money, that's one thing. The second thing is uh, whether they have to tax that much from that category of people or the tax uh, ratio thresholds have to be changed. Those are issues that need to come in, but all part of this thing, and I will not take you... What is very important here is you look at the man. This is what the graduation means. This is... Uh, a flood. I'm sure this uh, uh, this man, this is probably in Bangladesh, so he's very happy, he's smiling. He knows the floods are coming, but he has his livelihood in his hand. That's the machine. He can stitch the garments. And uh, if he can save this one, he has the knowledge, the water comes and go, but after that, he has a livelihood and he knows how to live. This is what we need to develop, I presume. And uh, I'll stop there. And uh, the graduation meaning that this part, you empower the people to do things. And also, government should uh, improve the environment to create more jobs and employment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ratnayaka, for that uh, treatment. And uh, there are three panelists waiting. Yes. So I was wondering whom should be invited first. I saw Dr. Sunil Ratnam was falling a bit asleep. Therefore, I thought to wake him up to invite him next so that uh, he can uh, share his views. Uh, I don't need to invite, I introduce Dr. Sunil Ratnam. He is involved in management, he is involved in uh, poverty alleviation, he was, he is involved in higher education, education. At present, he is the Director General of uh, National Institute of Education. So let me uh, invite uh, Dr. Sunil Navaratna to share his views on the subject. Thank you. Uh, 
Somalia. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ratnayaka, for your detailed presentation, and Dr. Harsha Atrupadi is here, and Professor Hittige, and also other professor, and also our Dr. Harsha Di Silva, and all the other prominent. Uh, uh, audience, <coughs> actually, uh, my question is why we are poor? Why we are poor? Because no income. Why we don't have income? Because we don't have employment opportunities in the village. Why there's no employment opportunities? We don't have enough entrepreneurs or private sector engagement. Uh, so if we can empower the uh, private sector, those people will start something at the village level and we should promote more and more or power uh, the enterprise at the regional level. For example, now we have uh, 10 million, uh, 1 million enterprises. Out of that, 900 something uh, enterprises are micro. Uh, one to four people are working. Then a small, about uh, 72,000, and uh, medium, and uh, small, large, only 2,000 enterprises. So <sighs> enterprises are created by the private sector and the enterprise entrepreneurs. Mostly our enterprises are a micro. So those micro enterprises are not graduated to the next level. So that is the biggest issue. Uh, due to some reason, uh, we, are, we don't have the enterprising mindset. So we always, through the education system, we produce job seekers or the job makers, but not the job creators. I think that is the fundamental issue in our country uh, because at the village level there are a lot of opportunities uh, but uh, there's no people who take the risk. In other words, we have A, people, uh, a type of uh, student B and C, A type of other people who are good in uh, memorizing and writing and they become engineers and doctors. Then the B type of people go to the uh, public sector and pri private sector and the C people are the people who take the risk and innova uh, take the in innovations and provide e employment. Unfortunately, this we have completely neglected the C type of people. They are the real people who can generate value addition and take risk and this. For example, Navalok Mudalal is a fifth grader. But under him, there are so many professors, doctors, engineers who are working. So, unfortunately, in our system, we don't have a system to nurture this C type of people, enterprises, enterprise mindset. I think that is the number one reason why. We have the poverty because in the region, in the uh, uh, villages, if there are enough uh, enterprises, especially value addition, so I think uh, it's a good answer to the problem. So Dr. Harsha is in the World Bank, ADB, all are there, and our uh, Dr. Harsha Silva is there. So let's think on that. Uh, the line that private sector is the engine. But unfortunately, our engine is like a motorcycle engine. Yes, <laughs> not powerful at all, right? And uh, we are not nurturing them. When a private sector person is trying to do something, a lot of uh, bottlenecks. So we are not supporting the private sector and no government incentives also. So uh, I talk this, uh, always tell this, uh, Government, public sector should be the gearbox of the support of the engine, but we have the gear, uh, engine somewhere and gearbox somewhere not coupled. And engine also 
the gearbox also trying to become the engine and the business karan lena and too much of thing so that support is not there for example i was in japan as you know uh, that honda is the great again uh, is the fifth grade right uh, he likes the motorcycle uh, engine oil smell and he started this small uh, motorcycle company with a clip on bike then now it has become a uh, huge industry and their total sales is bigger than four times bigger than sri lankan gdp our gdp is 80 uh, billion and they are 320 billion sales so why we are not supporting how many hondas have uh, nurtured in sri lanka but we are not supporting so this problem has to be identified because otherwise we can analyze the poverty and so many but no one is thinking how to alleviate the poverty through practical ways and means so education system has to be totally changed as dr harshan knows that a new education system especially in the 21st century we need critical thinking and problem solving skills creativity innovativeness entrepreneurship collaboration teamwork communication all this 21st century skills are lacking why because teacher goes and teach student are jotting the notes and finally vomiting in the exam within 3 hours <laughs> so always they have to repeat the same answer otherwise they don't get but how can we uh, nurture the critical thinking through answering the same thing so the professors are expecting the same answer according to the uh, model answer to get the so no need to think out of the box so something wrong with our system so our teaching learning program our process or curriculum even has to be changed so now we are promoting learner centered and learning centered instead of teacher centered so let the student learn if you have 25 uh, uh, student let them group into 5 into 5 groups and they can go to the internet and they can uh, go to the village and see the problems and find out answers not the same answer in the book so maybe they are learning demand and supply but applying that into the day to day problems problem based learning project based learning authentic learning all these things are the key words and uh, therefore this active learning uh, at present we have passive learning teacher teach and people are listening no students should become active learners for that we have to have group work uh, practice by doing and teach others they their uh, retention rate is very high but what is what we are doing is lecturing the retention is only 5% if they read only 10% audio visual 20 and demonstrate at 30% so all passive learners so we have to make the student a passive learners not only that but also the uh, uh, sorry active learners and the deeper learners at present we have surface learners remembering only understanding applying analyzing uh, synthesizing and creation is not there so higher order thinking has to be improved all these things are lacking uh, while we don't promote the uh, entrepreneurship so on the other way uh, the people sector should be the wheels of the uh, vehicle so people also highly suffering from the uh, what you call uh, dependency syndrome all are waiting someone to do something and they never work hard and get in time so private sector is the engine is very poor or very like a motorcycle engine we had to make it a uh, what you call this uh, racing racing engine or benz engine at least uh, it's very important so government uh, policies and all these others environment conducive environment should be created and public sector doesn't work as a gearbox it should support the uh, engine and people sector should work like a wheels but all the wheels are on the locks kota uda right have a pare and uh, demonstrating right how can uh, the country move forward more importantly third to fourth p the political sector should be the visionary and driver 
of the economy. So unfortunately, all peas are in scattered. Engine is somewhere, uh, gearbox is somewhere, the uh, wheels on the rock, uh, the locks, and we don't find uh, very few visionary leaders are there, but not enough. So that is uh, my answer for this issue. If we can make engine, gearbox, wheels, and the drivers together and make the vehicle, we can easily uh, reduce the power to within 10, 15 years. Unfortunately, we have been doing the same thing and giving, nurturing the dependency and uh, distributing uh, uh, the subsidies and not nurturing the country. And we have five times bigger sea, but we are not exploding. Right? But we are not exploding. So many resources are there, we are sleeping on it, right? It's like a nidane, we are sleeping on the nidane uh, and we are not exploiting it. All these things matters for this poverty. Uh, therefore, psychological poverty is the biggest. So we are not answering or attacking to the psychological poverty. That is the number one, yes? So if you need the economic poverty, we have to remove the psychological poverty. So psychological empowerment is the key. So that is also lacking. Tama kyanne vari aandu rasa gata palaya. Petition gata palaya. So people are going behind the politician and asking for a rohal kam karu ka makkad dinna sir. So that is, those are the issues. If you don't answer to these problems, we never remove the poverty. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sunil Aradna. You have been falling asleep, but you have woken us up with the <laughs> new, new thought. I think that's quite uh, interesting. We will come into that later. May, and thank you very much. And uh, can I invite uh, Professor Hittige? He was the professor of sociology in uh, University of Colombo. Now he's the emeritus professor. And uh, also, he's a well-known uh, writer. He knows, he writes to the community, he writes to the academia, he writes to the intellectual. And uh, let us uh, taste the, the pudding. Huh? Let me <coughs> begin by warning you about the proverbial elephant being described by five blind men. Uh, <coughs> I'm not talking about five <laughs> blind men here. <laughs> I'm talking about uh, a perennial problem that we faced in the academia. You know, we are so divided in terms of um, theoretical perspectives across various disciplines in the social sciences. Um, we have a tendency to really look at, you know, one little thing and try to explain everything in terms of that little thing. So you can think about microeconomics, macroeconomics, and so on. I'm not going into detail. But the point here is that, you know, even on you know, something which is not related to, you know, poverty. There has been a major controversy in the social sciences. Say, for instance, the Indian caste system, which is one of the most unequal social systems in the world, because it has some bearing on, you know, this issue that we are talking about, poverty and inequality. See, now, there the controversy was whether it was a structural phenomenon or a cultural phenomenon. It was uh, initiated by no other than Sir Edmund Leach, who did so much research in Sri Lanka and, of course, in, the, in, in, in this part of the world. Uh, I mean, he was at Cambridge, and he was knighted for his work, and so on and so forth. And he did a lot of very interesting work in Sri Lanka, published fully, and so on and so forth. Now, he, uh, he posed the question whether the Indian caste system, that unequal social system, is a structural phenomenon or a cultural phenomenon. Now, on poverty itself, I, let me take you to another uh, you know, very prominent uh, anthropologist, American anthropologist, Oscar Lewis. He published a book in 1966. The title was Culture of Poverty. Now, you can see the, <laughs> see the connection and disconnection. You see, I mean, they are, you know, basically, you know, poverty, culture of, culture of poverty means it, it, you know, it can, re culture reproduces itself, we know that. They are similarly, 
you know, poverty can also reproduce. But anyway, the point is the ultimate conclusion uh, in, the, in the analysis uh, uh, of the caste system in here by Sir Edmund Lee, it was a structural phenomenon. And we have written so much about caste in Sri Lanka and so on and so forth, and they are, you know, the people are basically torn between these two polar opposites. You know, some people treat it as a cultural phenomenon. So you, you know, so you have to change the culture if you want to change that. And the other one was, it is a structural phenomenon, therefore there are structural underpinnings and therefore you have to bring about structural change. Now that is where I come in now. Now poverty, as we all know, is very much a reflection of the level of inequality in a society. I mean, more inequality you have, more poor people you will have. I mean, I don't have to tell, talk to you about this, no economists know. When you have a very highly unequal income distribution, then naturally you will have, you will have more poor people at the bottom, right? And so unless you r reduce inequality, that is why, you know, under the SDGs, they say, you know, they talk about poverty reduction, poverty elimination, true, but they also talk about reducing inequality. Now you can look at the situation in Europe and the United States. Now United States is one of the most developed countries in the world. But it is also a country where you have a high level of inequality. I mean, all, top, all kinds of inequality in terms of, also in terms of, but whereas if you look at some of the European countries, like for instance, the Nordic countries, I have a close uh, experience with some of the Nordic countries. I have also taught in one of these countries. The point there is, you know, you, you have basically reduced inequality to a minimum through structural interventions, right? And then you are, you are dealing with what? You, you can't eliminate uh, poverty because, uh, anyway, that's another story. You can't eliminate. So the point is you can make it a residual problem. You know, you have to make it a residual problem. When you make it a residual problem, you're dealing with a small problem. When you are dealing with a pervasive problem, you are dealing with a problem that you can't address. So you can actually keep on, you know, wasting your time, energy, money, and everything. You will have, you will just keep. So the point is that. So now the question, of course, is if it is a structural problem, then you have to have structural remedies. Now I don't have to tell you about these two economies, right? I don't have to tell you, but I'll give you a few examples now. Now, what do, why do you invest? Why do we invest in education? Why do we invest in health? Why do we invest in public transport? Why do we invest in, you know, training, you know, young people and, and people who want to get into self -help? Why do we invest in all these things? Right? Now, of course, with <laughs> how much you can invest depends on the proportion of the GDP that you have at your disposal. At, in a country where you have 8% of the GDP, 10% of the GDP, what, what can you do? I mean, when the, when the university people ask for 6% of the GDP, can you give 8, 6% of 8% to education? Utter nonsense. But the point, but if you have 55% of the GDP, if you have 46% of the GDP, what is the problem in giving 7% to education? So the point is that, that you see, this is where the, this whole debate about taxation and pro and so on and so forth. And then, you know, we have, you know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to go round and round because you have the whole world open to you to look at. That is what empirical evidence is all about. Of course, we can look at, generate our own empirical evidence. But the point is that we are living in a world where, you know, people produce, you know, tons of evidence for us to look at. Not that we have to be guided entirely by what you know, other people have. But the point is, you know, here in this country also. Now, so the point is that, that look at the labor force. Very small labor force, 8.5 million. Now where are these 8.5 million? You have 1.3 million driving three wheels. What is the, what is the value of it? Of course, you know, they, they, they contribute to you know, uh, you know, mobility, but the point is, you know, what is the substitute? I mean, when we were students in the University of Colombo in the 70s, I mean, there were, there were hardly any cars in, 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 the, Colum in the Colombo city. Or, 
and you know they were double decker buses going all all around. So we just we you know got into double decker and go to where, where, which part of the. So the point is, then 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 you know. So the point is, mobility is so critical. And why did Europeans invested in public transport? I I I taught in Switzerland for a year, and and I, I my my friends in the university they, they didn't have a car. Professors, they were not uh, you know <laughs> you know. Just temporary lecture or so. They are professors. Did, they, they, why do you? So the point is, you know, now when you put when you put money into it, you are not thinking about the rich. You are thinking about the people who who, who have no money, who, who don't have too much money. Why do you have a good health system? Public health system, because you know health is a need for everyone, whether you are rich or poor, or, you know, rural or urban or whatever. So, so you have, and then 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 you have to have. You see, uh, you know, the, the 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 training, education. Now, education. <laughs> I mean, the point is one. Th now we talk about modern technology and all kinds of stuff. Now we have two two thirds of the schools do not have science stream at A level. Two. I mean, I, I think we have an education is there. I mean, the point is the majority of the schools don't have science stream. Now that is why you you end up you know you, you we have a lot of rural schools, uh, you know send ch uh, people to university and they end up in uh, they end up in the arts faculty and of course nowadays you have commerce and various things therefore they get di they get distributed but when we were in the university most of the fellows ended up in science in the in the in the in the um, arts arts faculty so the point is point is now these are the these are the the, these are the issues that you have to look at. This is where public policy comes in, right? At a, at a, you know how you know you, unless and until you address these issues. Now the other thing is, of course, you know deindustrialization in this country. In the United States, deindustrialization did did not lead to a massive calamity because the new technologies uh, came up and uh, most of the big uh, companies are now technology companies. But whereas here. When you deindustrialize, de get rid of all the primary industries. I mean, the prime example is the, you know the, the textile industry. You promote uh, you know you promote the garment industry, and that becomes the largest industry without textile uh, uh, production. That that is that was something that was there all over the country, right? Now see the point is now now see how things can be. Can, I, I don't want to go on and on, but the point is that you have to have. Uh, an understanding of the larger picture. If you don't have an understanding of the larger picture, you can go round and round, and you, you will end up with the same solution that that is giving handouts. I mean, and you know, both both of them say hand, hand, and uh, so the point is that unless who is going to invest in in these in these areas, you now tell me we have one of the most unequal education systems in this country. On the one hand, rural schools have almost nothing. There are schools where they, 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 there's hardly any uh, any facilities. But here you have how many international schools are there? And look at you. You just go to one of these international schools, you know, around midday, and look look at the massive struggle that the parents they, they come in their hundreds, you know, to take their children. And then there are huge buses parked in front of these places to take you know children from Colombo to so many other places. So now, what 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 is the value added from international school? Now, where did we learn English? I learned English in the village school. Of course, now you can't learn it even even learn it even in in, in Colombo at um, Ananda College, or, or maybe even at Royal College you don't learn English anymore. <laughs> but that is what we have done. So the point is educational policy. So anyway, I think I have taken too much of your time. I, I think uh, I I just wanted to be a bit more provocative. You know, to to rock, to really rock the boat a little, uh, unless you unless you have a, unless you have a critical analysis, you will be just going round and round, and you will come back to the same point. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Ettige. Now the other uh, panelist, uh, Professor Chandrasena, is a silent researcher, but uh, he will uh, share his uh, views. On power, he is an expert in uh, re regional rural development and the uh, poverty alleviation. 
He is from uh, Kalani University, Professor of Geography. Let me uh, invite uh, Professor Chandrasen. Thank you, uh, John. And uh, I thank Gamli Korea Foundation for uh, inviting me for this panel discussion, and also Dr. Ratnayaka for uh, inviting me to uh, comment on his paper. And paper was circulated uh, before his presentation, so that I went through the paper. Uh, yeah, I had very little time anyway, uh, but uh, I found certain points in his paper to discuss in the uh, panel, in this forum, and I think it is worth he uh, compiled a lot of information uh, from different sources about the current situation of poverty in the country and uh, it uh, um, made a, a comprehensive analysis, very broad analysis about the poverty uh, scenario of the country. I think uh, it opened for wider discussion uh, among the academics, policy makers, uh, I'm happy, uh, Dr. Harsha is there, and also practitioners uh, in different fields, not only poverty, uh, reduction strategies alone. And I think uh, uh, this paper gives some uh, information about current recent trends in the country, in the economy, due to COVID. Uh, 19 impact, also failure of agriculture policies and shrinking economy, uh, economy due to the productivity uh, losses and other things, and uh, due to loan recovery issues and balance of payment issues, restriction of inflows of income to the country, and so on. And if those things, uh, I think, in some way, uh, led to a shrinking economy in the country. It has been discussed in different forums, in macro and micro economics analysis is the leading area in these discussions. I am basically a geographer and my perspective is spatial and I am not elaborating those things as uh, economist or other uh, social scientists. And Dr. Navratna and Professor Hettige elaborated uh, very wide uh, concerns, I think, area about the poverty situation in the third world countries. And we have to learn a lot of things from these, you know, these situations, uh, as Professor Hettige said. I think we have forgotten most of the things or neglected. So that I think uh, it is the time not to delay and in policy making we have to uh, consider the realities and the real strategies to practice. I think uh, uh, in one area I am concerned is the identification of poverty as Dr. Atnaika introduced in the beginning. Uh, it has been a long process since this consumption poverty level was, well, line was introduced long ago. We are uh, going on very conventional poverty measures like head count index, head count ratio index, and other uh, poverty measures. But we are uh, not considering the real variables we have to identify the poor both quantitative and qualitative. Uh, I think in some areas, the poor identified themselves as poor, not due to this consumption poverty index or criteria or income poverty or other thing. In different ways, Professor Ratnapala published a book long ago uh, about these things based on his case studies in villages, uh, asking people why you are considered as poor. These kind of things, I think, 
we have to consider in our wider discussions and also uh, we have to uh, apply the measures of poverty to target the poor for poverty relief programs or assistance or other things. As uh, Dr. Aknaik said, the, this uh, graduation, graduating from poverty or out of poverty cannot be applied to all the people who are below the poverty line. I think we have to classify them as whether they are chronic uh, in chronic poverty or transient poverty or any other way. There are so many terms we have applied in classifying poor. But in practice, we are not graduating them like that. Some of the beneficiaries are not the same in everywhere. In every uh, village, you find different types of people who are benefited by the same uh, poverty relief program. So that we have to identify the uh, poorest of the poor or ultra poor or whatever it is according to the very uh, reliable or very valuable measures. We have to identify those. Things. I think those things comes after very uh, intensive research uh, and information availability. So that I think uh, it is one area we have to consider. And poverty is normally considered as deprivation of material uh, goods or material uh, resources or material benefits. So that uh, poverty sh should be equated with lack of well-being. There are other concepts related with human well-being. So that we have to apply the well-being as uh, get it, uh, as lack of poverty. So to develop human well-being, there are so many other things except poverty relief or uh, poverty reduction strategies in a country. So that uh, a wide area have to be considered or covered uh, in uh, reducing poverty in a country. And uh, in his paper, he has uh, mentioned about opportunities available for poverty reduction. I went through certain areas about different policy perspectives like enhancing productivity, uh, sustainable development and other things. Uh, I think enhancing productivity is very important as uh, Dr. Nautokun said. In any development effort, we have to uh, have a target of what is the productivity we get through our investment. What is the added value of the investment? Like that. So that I think uh, enhancing productivity is very important in future poverty reduction strategies. And also, uh, as I am very much interested about the regional development, that is special variations in poverty is not very much concerned in policy making in the country or in other countries also like that. Because macro level data are being used for poverty uh, reduction strategies. So that uh, regional variations so spatial patterns comes little later. Very uh, recently the geographers are interested in poverty mapping, poverty pockets and poverty clusters and so on. So that we have to identify the spatial variations or spatial patterns of poverty and develop poverty maps to make regional development strategies to reduce poverty. Not only uh, regional development is not only poverty reduction, there are other purposes also. Uh, it is one way of developing a region. And other area I am concerned is the, uh, especially in the rural areas, non-farm 
sector. Rural non-farm sector is not considered in development strategies uh, widely. I think still even the policy making level, the assistance are subsidies are given there and assistance and subsidies are given to the farmers, agriculture sector. Why we are not interested in developing non-farm sector? Because agriculture mostly a part time work. It is not eighty hours work of the farmer. He spent it's hard work. He spent very few hours a day. But rest of the day he can spend uh, not buying such hard work for some productive activities like that. And also in uh, rural areas we find some uh, non-farm activities which are not very important in, uh, in contributing the uh, productivity of the rural economy. Value addition is very low. So that uh, I think it is an area we have to consider. And also we find some uh, informal economic activities are emerging in the recent past, like why we see uh, roadside vendors, vegetables, stalls, fruit sellers, uh, and ready-made uh, clothes, or so many things. While you are driving the road, you can find so many informal economic activities, traders are there. I think these are not very much regulated. So that I think there should be some measure to secure their economy and make their economy sustainable and profitable. They are, they are earning a very marginal income, I think. So that, that area, I think, uh, should be considered in uh, poverty reduction studies because the most of the people who are beneficiaries of some of the other things are also involved in this area, uh, economic activities. If we can uh, secure their economy and upgrade their economic level, I think we can reduce the dependency on relief. Like that, uh, there are so many areas we have to consider, like uh, diversification of household income, and other things uh, in poverty reduction activities. Those are the things I am just uh, uh, interested uh, and I have uh, discussed with Dr. Atnaik in many times about uh, certain areas and I think uh, he has wide vision about all these things uh, than I uh, know with my experience. So that I think uh, poverty uh, reduction strategies have to be revised, reconsidered and developed after a wider discussion uh, in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Chandrasena. You have listened to four eminent speakers, and they have looked at the same issue, poverty and poverty alleviation, in four different directions. I am sure uh, this vociferous uh, uh, speaker, Dr. Harshadisil, has collected a lot of food for thought and for his next speech. And uh, <coughs> that after listening listen to uh, <coughs> four eminent speakers, two doctors and two professors, this simple Mr. Malia, there is nothing much to add. But I would like to <coughs> see how do we sort of, uh, they have provided food, a lot of uh, evidence-based uh, policy decisions to achieve sustainable development goal in poverty in all its forms everywhere. So that's what they have contributed to. Now, <coughs> I would like to draw your attention to a few recent reports came out. One is... Uh, the study conducted by a research team, Academics of uh, Economics Department, University of Peradeniya. It was led by Professor Ch Prema Chandra Atukorala. And uh, their conclusion is over 9 million people or more than 40% of population have slipped into the official poverty bracket due, due to the country's unending economic crisis. 
So the reason is found in the economic crisis. Then <coughs> the Sri Lanka development update April 2023 by World Bank, the economic crisis is estimated to have doubled the poverty rate up from 13.1 in 20, uh, 2021 to 25% in 2022. This increase has added an additional 2.1 and then see, many non-poor households living close to the poverty line are highly vulnerable to falling into poverty. So again, the World Bank has found the economic crisis as the reason poverty uh, increase. Then study conducted collectively by the Department of Census and Statistics, the UNICEF and the uh, the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative attached to the University of Oxford reveals that 42% of children below four years and one out of every six people are multidimensionally poor. Even the merciless IMF has made provisions for this uh, safe social safety net. So, which means the poverty has become the prominent issue in our economic uh, development scenario. But uh, <clears throat> United Nations World Population Prospects 2022 says reducing poverty in the context of rapid population growth remains a formidable challenge. In many cases, even though poverty reduction strategies may lift large numbers of people out of poverty, the proportion of the population living below the poverty line may be stagnant or even increase. So that's the conclusion. Now, <clears throat> we can see the, the economic background, economic crisis or economic reasons has affected a lot for this poverty. And power, then poverty alleviation also should find explanations or way out, ways out in the economic development. This is why the I, there's a IMF World Bank uh, report on macroeconomic policy and poverty reduction their conclusion is economic growth is the single most important factor influencing poverty. Numerous statistical studies have found a strong association between national per capita income and national poverty indicators. When formulating a country's poverty reduction strategy, policymakers, including politicians, will need to assess and that was I added there, will need to assess and determine what is the most appropriate combination of key macroeconomic targets. So it has become a macroeconomic issue. So I can remember Dr. Ratna Ayaka was involved in this poverty alleviation program way back in 1988 uh, with, uh, when uh, uh, Mr. President, late President Premadas introduced the Janasavya program. And uh, he knows better than me. And uh, this may be the reason this Indian politician, Karan Singh, maybe Dr. Harshad Isila knows him. He has said, Development is the best contraceptive to poverty reduction. So that's what he has said. Maybe you will quote that tomorrow. And the poverty alleviation, usually in this country, we are looking at as a social issue. Poverty and the poverty alleviation. And then also we come out with social development solutions to alleviate poverty. But uh, there is a, there is a strong link, as uh, uh, Dr. Sunil Navaratna said, that we have neglected the private sector. There should be a, there should be a public, private, community sector driven poverty reduction program. I think we have to think of that is why he said that gearbox is one place uh, and so for these things. I don't know whether we have engine or growth, but whatever it is, <coughs> that uh, uh, we have to. We are usually looking at poverty alleviation as a bottom up approach, but we have neglected or we have overlooked the top-down approach. I can remember way back, there, no, there were two persons, many policymakers talk of the poverty elevation as a social development program, social welfare program, or simply taking it out of the context of the macroeconomic development. There were two persons who talk of this poverty in the context of economic development. One is Dr. Ratnayaka. One day he told me, Chandra, you know, we must find the exit point. So that means that, you know, you will not feed the poor, keep them in poverty, but you have to take them out. That was the first time I heard, and then I asked, and he explained it to me. Then the second man is, was uh, late President Premadasa. He also talked of this, uh, taking the 
Wow, that is why he called it Jana Savya, to strengthen, that is the people's strength, to strengthen the people. So there, yeah, you know, he wanted, he, the, he introduced a basket of uh, commodities at that time. And that basket of commodities, usually the cooperative societies and the Samurdi societies, they used to go to the bazaar and buy a few uh, enamel and aluminium products and put into the basket and say, one day President Premanda said, you know, I do not want these fellows to go to the bazaar and buy these things. Get the Janathavi a beneficiary to produce something. Maybe a acre broom, broom or some koya products, whatever it is, are they produce. And then, you know, you put that into the basket. You create a production circle with the market. And then, you know, he wanted the Janathavi officers to introduce, this, uh, introduce the products in that particular village and the neighboring villages into this basket basket of uh, commodity. And also, not only that, he introduced this uh, garment factory program, 200 garment factory program. One day he told me, you know, Malia, that this country cannot, this economy cannot be developed with the garment industry. I introduced this for two things. One is that I want to take the investor to the periphery. Second thing is I want to have a link. I have to create a market for the Janasavya products. And then he said, you go to Galevala, speak to the owner, and ask him to st open, a, the, open a collecting center. And then ask him to buy the vegetable, uh, fruits, and other products of the Janasavya beneficiary. Then you have created the market. You make this link. That is what he said. So this is, these are the two persons. I. Then uh, we are talking of this uh, poor of the poor. Yeah, I want to refer that uh, Janasavya Trust Fund was there. I think Ratnayak was a member there, member of the board of directors. Then Chatya uh, Ratnayak was the chairman, and then uh, Professor <coughs> Hevaitana was another member. So Professor Hevaitana was quite interested in looking for this, uh, the poorest of the poor. So Chatya Ratnayak one day said, Professor, I will buy a few uh, microscopes. You take them to the field and then go on looking for the poorest of the poor. That's what he said. So he said, you know, we are going after concepts and various things, but we don't try to link the macro, the poverty alleviation to the macroeconomic policy. I think that's enough for the for now. But I have to say one thing now. President Premadas has started the, this national level poverty alleviation program. It is also Janasavya, that is the people's strength. So it strength. Then it was little bit diluted as Samurdi. Samurdi is little tilted towards uh, the, the charity. Then now it is Aswatuma. Ratnayaka said it is uh, Aswatuma is, uh, you said, uh, comforting. So like, you know, we give a put a trophy or some sweet into the in the baby cries. So so I hope this entire process will not end up in Astra Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to uh, uh, ask Dr. R.M. Kiratnayaka for his uh, final comments on the discussion. The thank you, and it's uh, very helpful, the comments. I will take those comments into consideration. What's, what's important is, yes, we learn a lot. One thing that Dr. Navaratna said, that uh, private sector involvement in poverty elevation, I'm sure that uh, Harsha may be aware we had a very good program with the private sector, all big companies, to employ graduates. It's called Tarun Arun. We hired uh, something like 300 or 400 people of it. 90 people were employed by John Keels because their directors were in that uh, company. They, their own money. They trained them over a period of a year. and. Uh, the public servant salary, I mean, the lowest entry point was about 15,000 at the time. Some people were able to get about 80,000 rupees uh, as their salary, and they explained it to him, them 
even people like Ken Balendra, we started like this, but these companies, if you are good enough, they will not look at any other aspect, only the capabilities of people, and you can move forward. Then the government announced the teaching appointments. 90% of those people left that with those salaries. And the private sector said, you see, they are blamed. Now, the company people are blaming us because you took these graduates over others. I mean, what they basically do is taking uh, people with O levels and advanced level with sports and various other things. That's their requirement. Other professionals, they recruit in a different path. And uh, this is one of the things. Then uh, we again tried uh, other ways, like Mr. Malia said, that uh, purchasing center scheme where we ask these people to pay, uh, produce something, give it to these companies, these are private sector, and they can link that uh, with the school midday meal program. Very good idea. But unfortunately, we have a severe problem of government financing. Uh, DG, National Planning, ACA. Problem is, you see, the schools, the rural people cannot supply to a particular school with 100 children or more than 100 for one month without getting a payment. The government payment procedures are so slow that man virtually goes bankrupt. So the whole scheme collapsed. If you want to try tie these programs to a government department and to pay money from there, it won't work. I mean, look at the very thriving the construction sector. Companies are so large and they can borrow from the banks, uh, but they have to pay the cost. Some of the bills, they are not settled for about a year. How these companies... No, this is there's an internal structural problem in the country. Taking private sector and linking with poverty elevation, we have that. But also, there's another... The people, enterprise, entrepreneurial people work in the small uh, trade sector, like uh, uh, vegetable sellers, uh, buying strawberries from Nuralia and bring it here in Colombo and sell it like that. And also, you see, government, uh, Dr. Hashashila should uh, learn these things. It's important. Extremely difficult to restructure any government department. I'm working in the president's office, uh, and we were asked to look at the agriculture ministry because that ministry, some of the departments were created in the 1940s. They are irrelevant today to restructure the 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 uh, opposition comes from the top. And this is the directive of the president, but it won't work like that. I mean, only thing that we were successful in doing that exercise, I know, you know that in this country, uh, we have cattle population, very large cattle population. There's no feeding program for those. I mean, you have, there's, there's, it is not possible in this country to uh, grow grass as a crop. It's not within the agriculture ministry said, and uh, you cannot uh, grow that crop in a abundant paddy field. You cannot take government, I mean, regulated water supply to that. And it took about uh, three months. And the president secretary called another secretary and said, "If you don't guess at this, I will see another secretary will come and he will do the thing." And this was guess. I'm sorry for the secretary, but he's a nice man. But the blocks come from the top. So finally, that was gazetted that agriculture ministry now we accept that as a crop. You can grow that in uh, the abundant paddy fields and so on. Also in some Mahavali lands under irrigation. So with that, you can link it with the farm, the cattle farming. Now again, government can't, I mean, we, we have experience in this. Indian line of credit is coming and um, uh, uh, the Private sector people are working with uh, Indian Amul company. Uh, who is your friend? Uh, uh, this page. Uh, yeah, and uh, they are forming a company, and some of the government properties will be leased out because they are not uh, perhaps working properly, and to bring some cattle from India by the private sector, not by the government, and also goats. And if you improve that, especially in the north and the east, where people are ready to undertake, 
poverty could be eradicated in those areas within 2 to 3 years but in other areas we have problems because you see if you give that to buddhist family they might say no we are not going to kill them to do what with that i mean if you don't kill the uh, the the uh, animal you can't keep it no i mean you don't do the milking and so on so these are there are structural problems there are cultural problems uh, we have but then you have to overcome that there are other things to do as the number one as uh, malia said that one of the problems is if the economic growth is not taking place and there are no avenues i mean basically consumption has to go up you see it was very interesting somebody told me uh, this uh, when um, amartya sen was defending his uh, thesis a lot of people knew that uh, he is a clever man and uh, they came and uh, they sat behind and one fellow one senior professor asked uh, when he was presenting uh, simply asked what is demand and if if i'm sure that uh, if if somebody asks that question from me at the time of you defend your thesis you are pretty worried because he looked at that he was a professor and nobel prize winner he said that's consumption has started his uh, whole argument because demand is consumption if you don't consume you don't demand any good no so the the level of confidence so like that we need to restructure some of these things and to take it forward i am sure as uh, malia the said uh, as uh, you see now we have 1.6 million three wheelers but of course government are now uh, put a cap in that you can't buy one it's cost about more than more than nearly about 6 700000 unit and therefore people don't buy but those young people the mothers wanted that you see they don't they wanted a white collar job for this man if they can't find one collar job uh, they just uh, buy the three wheeler the number of studies have been conducted by the, uh, the katwad the university and they found that uh, you see even the people who are working as three wheeler drivers are not getting a sufficient income because they are competing if you need one one uh, wheeler at a place you have about five and uh, there's no demand uh, that is one of the things what we need to look at is think a fresh and to uh, do something uh, differently and what is that different thing is something that we need to invent one of the things is what we see is actually take this uh, whole the 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 areas where we lost back to production that's about you see that's about employment of over a million people construction industry is one somehow that has to come back and uh, there are lot of small trades small trading houses where they were doing these things privately husband and wife or independently and some of the people are producing something that you cannot import those items anymore so obviously you got stuck and you can immediately remove 1 million people who are ready to move out of this one but then there will be new additions that you cannot stop so important policy issue that comes in the state set state set was never uh, given uh, a chance under the the welfare system now there is a severe uh, uh, understanding plus uh, noise coming through the political system as well as to identification to include them that we need to do i will take uh, all these uh, comments the very valuable i will take it and actually one of the things that we are trying to look at is this evidence based uh, investments uh, these are short terms and you cannot uh, invest in poverty for 5 years it lo- it should be very quick and also one of the things is that we don't have money but i know that donors are interested in uh, coming with balance of payment support to the government and uh, actually we need to prepare ourselves from the bureaucracy to get the projects on i mean un- th- that we have a general i mean it's not good for me to say that uh, I, i i cannot say that the time that we work was good and this is not but government is uh, the dg might say they are lacking people 
they don't have that many people to work and the system is also geared to look for your the benefits that you get rather than the things that you can offer to the system so unfortunately a large number of retired people are working in different places the issue is that don't know whether they have contributed something during their useful life uh, in the public sector but in the re in retirement they are suggesting so many things to the government we will see this uh, one of the things that we have proposed is the graduation out of poverty it's a time bound uh, program that very intensive work with the communities it all depends on whether the officials that we have i mean in the samudhi department we have 24000 are they ready to do that if not we have to find another way out thank you uh, thank you very much uh, dr atnayak uh, we shall now open the floor for q and a sessions I have two specific questions, Dr. Ratnayak. Since this is, uh, uh, you know, the screen is on this. Now, today I was looking at the uh, Corte DSD's uh, Aswasuma data. Mm. So whatever that you have made available or the, the Welfare Benefits Board, it's a big problem. You see, you have this multi-deprivation index that you are going to build. Technically, it sounds very good, right? I mean, you are looking at all these different issues. But when you actually start looking at the data, you see it's voluntarily given. No, in any case, they just say this is my income, that this is my expenditure, and they are not in any sense of the word accurate you know some people are saying they're living of 1900 rupees now, you can't really question them also right now they when i asked the people who are doing it they said no no we are having a committee we'll set up a committee the the enumerator the assistant uh, divisional secretary and somebody else and we'll go through it there are 7,300 odd records and 22 different uh, variables they have collected data. So, so, so this already seems to be a, a big failure. But on the other hand, electricity, right? I think Delaney and all had done some work on this. Yeah, the correlation between the consumption of electricity and poverty is, I think, very strong. But what bothered me is when you put that weight, weights, I don't know if that's the same weightage that you're using to build this index. It seems to me that all these different uh, indicators, or variables have pretty much the same weight. Right, but then that will give you a really <laughs> false uh, sense of what poverty really is. In my mind, I think if you give, you know, 75% to electricity and then you give some wage to others, I'm just throwing a number, I don't have any data to back my argument. I'm just saying we can take a look at it would be far more accurate than what I think is going to, uh, I think we are going to get through this, through this uh, model that you people are building. Right? So I, 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 because technically, theoretically, this sounds good. But I'm telling you, having seen the data today, it is not going to come up with the, or bring the results that you expect right so i don't know whether you can give an answer to my question yeah but uh, we know that there are there is another problem we want the other problem is uh, uh, basically 
you uh, there's no particular cut off point to identify this 400 800000 1.2 million that had to be allocated by the by the welfare benefits board to each of the divisional secretariat proportionately to the present uh, uh, the number of beneficiary that had to be worked out number one number two it is easy to get uh, this uh, uh, electricity number if you take electricity alone people will protest that's why we added all other things it's easy to take the electricity one because it's already there the computer can pick it up so that's what i'm saying so you might as well do that because otherwise you are going to get inaccurate data right because you know that already this is highly politicized no right i mean some of the people didn't participate in the enumeration exercise but you know what really happened no mm. they went and told the people look these other fellows are coming they are coming to cut your samurthi you know so make sure that you do what needs to be done i'll tell you what to kind of do but kind of business that's what happened samurthi guy went and said yeah. right so so if you can wait in that slide you had up there were those the weights to to you know you, uh, you determine uh, the index no it vary from place to place no uh, it may vary but by and large yes it is yeah but then if you do that the electricity also gets like 4% weight no yeah so but then then no, the, the idea is to distribute uh, the resource package that they have this tested in many we have tested it here it works very well it works very well because that correlation uh, of electricity with uh, in rural areas without a well are very i will give some work that so, so that's what i'm saying so if it correlates well why don't you do that why don't you give it a lot more weight my point is that right? why don't you give it a lot more weight than 4% no the the maximum is 4 no no why 4 no it is. i mean even if you give 10 that, that's how it works i mean the 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 formula developed on the basis that you have maximum up to 4 you can even make 10 no no so what i'm saying is if we know that it is going to come up with a wrong number at the end of the day because a lot of this is just voluntarily given data which is wrong because i asked the persons today how are you going to do it they say we'll, we'll look at the income No, no. The no. income is wrong. No, no, no. We look at the expenditure. Expenditure is better than income. But really, otherwise, how are they going to do it? No, they have the, a committee of three people. Uh, can I? Uh, I think uh, I think I agree with uh, Dr. Ratnayaka. This was tested, sir. Uh, the Paduka we identify and we collect the data. We use the formula and it's tested. Is hundred percent accurate with the field level data as well as the collected data and after analysis, the is exact the same. even uh, the indian company came invited by the world bank and because they were not very happy when we developed this system and they were asked us to use the uh, proxy mean test we were not happy because it is not very clear for us then they were bring a one company from india and they analysis both proxy mean test as well as what we have proposed and then they say this was the good method and now world bank is taking into the world this is the good method uh, for the poverty uh, Uh, calculation of the uh, or identification of the poor people and this is very good i i know you you might have some issues with the data i i also might have an issue with the data what they have collected but we need to get the real data from the family itself otherwise the the calculation or whatever it is wrong i i agree with the the data what we collected but the system and the process and the uh, the formula and everything is perfect that's i want to tell you you see we have we have the family size number of children whether they are the disabled child or the household and uh, number of other things and uh, the very high correlation with those with poverty so see, we can add uh, more way to electricity and see whether we can match see, see the thing is this no so, uh, professor one minute right the thing is you are having three people in the committee yeah okay Now these three people will have in my division secretary's division go through 8000 7900 uh, uh, you know people's applications mm. okay 
Now each one has 22 different things Indicator. that you have collected. Yeah. Indicators. Indicators, right? And only two are actual. What is that? Yes. Electricity and water. Now what about age? Oh, no, no. Those no, no, those are also factor in. No, no, no. I, I agree. Yes. But I agree. But, but I, I know the problem. You, it's not easy to convince people. No. So what I'm saying is, it is going to be so difficult for these yes, three yes. human beings. Yeah. Right. To go and check uh, 22 indicators in 8,000 homes, and and because if you're giving sort of equal weights to all these things. I don't know how where you say it is already perfect because we haven't tested it. I mean, you may have tested it in some pilots, yeah. but 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 you can't say it is hundred percent correct unless you sort of you talked about Duflo and Banerjee. I mean, you can't. No, you will have to do that type of test to see whether it is perfect or not. These randomized trials and things like yeah. that because today's evaluation. Uh, techniques are really not up to standard and that is why they won the Nobel Prize for thinking outside the box mm. in social uh, program evaluation. So that's, let's leave that for a moment. But before we say it is perfect, we have to actually implement it. right? And, and as, a, as a person who is on the ground dealing with these people on a daily basis, right? I know the real issues. Right? And I'm just trying to say, right? pardon me for saying this, that you should think about, uh, and also then let us look at the model. I mean, let, let, let us, I you know, let us look at how you do this. No problem. Right? Yeah. No, the, the I think you, uh, this is, we know that problem is yet to come because earlier we had 1.7 million people getting Samudhi under this one, so under Samudhi, the present one, although we have 2 million, 1.2 million are the real poor. Actually, even the earlier system, when it comes to your area, 50% 50 50 of the beneficiaries will not get some of the, because they are better off. I mean, I'm not saying anything. You and me on, agree on this, but politically it's very difficult to uh, face. This is one of the problems. Second is, we have a generic problem in the system. Uh, the number of units that you get has to be determined by the board. Who can't take one cut-off point? I mean, cut-off point that suits you is not useful for umpire or somewhere because there may be large number of people with very high index because in the higher the index, the more poverty uh, is. And uh, your one may have uh, less compared to people in Ampara. That has to be worked out in the board to reduce the tension. That is one of the problems that they may face, but that requires a lot of uh, thinking. But as you said, do you see even the welfare benefit, we can suggest to use the uh, electricity bill as one of the, it is no, there. So we can do even what you just proposed, the electricity, even data already collected. Electricity is one of the criteria. Even we can check after evaluation, uh, whether the it, it has correlation, the final figure. How about the telephone? Can I can I can I come in and this? I mean, certainly, <coughs> you know, we want to develop perfect system based on, you know, very accurate, you know, indicators and all, all these things, right? I mean, that's at the national level. We want to we want to do that. Now the question is, you know, when you take it down to the grassroots, it is not rocket science. It is not rocket science. It is, a ro it is rocket science, you know, at the national level when, you know, the people from various disciplines sit around the table and debate and discuss and come up with a framework, conceptual framework, and then you put in, you know, data to, you know, illustrate the model. But the point is when you go down to the, the, the local level, at a, let's say, for instance, we have 14,000 GN divisions. Now, you know, the point is we are living at a very difficult pe uh, time, you see. So the point is everybody is under pressure. You see, the all, almost all the families are so dependent on private tuition, whether we like it or not. You know, they, they, you know, if you have children, you are dependent. Now, you can imagine the agony of a low-income person. Because, you know, you don't want your children not to go to private tuition. Because, you see, because, you know, then it is actually deprivation uh, from their p p point of view.
because you know you will be at a at a disadvantage when you when you go for the exam and so on. So anyway, that that has to be addressed separately. With they do, I mean, we can address that too separate. But the fact of the matter is that we have no system, you know, objective, uh, you know, arrangement. I'm I'm talking about, you know, I mean, the point is at the end of the day we we should have a system at the, you know, let's say the local level at the community level to keep an eye on. Uh, these families. I don't think that in a, in a, in a, if you go to a, a, a GN division, I mean, everybody knows who is really, you know, in this situation or not. I mean, you can use one criterion, you can use several criterion, whatever, but the fact of the matter is that it is possible. But the fact, but the point is that, you know, we, we do it in a very ad hoc way, you know, when it, when it comes to, go, you know, dealing with that at a local level, we don't, and I'll say, for instance, if you have a community-based monitoring system, which is, you know, established, you know, uh, you know, which, which is established, you know, at, at, at that level, and you have several people, you know, who can really manage it. See, but there are young people, I mean, there are young people, maybe employed people already in the, in the, in the DS office and so on and so forth. You know, you can handpick, and then you can establish that community-based monitoring system, and actually this can be electronically also managed. Right. So the po point is that if, if you if you develop a you you, you establish a, a community-based monitoring system, I, I can I have, I have done a, a bit of a, a diagram. And I can send it to you. You see, the point is that if you if you do that, then you make sure that you know it is accepted by people. Now you know everybody is trying to you know play with each other. You know I mean now you know they are all trying to get into it naturally. You know under economic pressure. But then now how to prevent it? You know, if it is objective and if it is, you know, accepted, you know, by people that some people have to opt out, some people have to be in, then you know, it is it is also at a people level uh, who who really accept this. Of course, you know, this will not solve the, the other problems. I mean, that naturally people have other problems also. You know, you know, not having enough money to you know ma you know really ma maintain the minimum standard that is a big big issue. So I think I think this we should try we should try it. So the point is that we always try to take the data from from the villages, you know, then basically put it together here and come up with this uh, uh, report, and which is of course very necessary for policy making. Other, but you know that alone is not going to work. Why did India establish a community-based monitoring system in 2020, when when COVID, you know, really impacted on so many families? Uh, you know, because they had, they couldn't go out and why did they establish it? And that was supported by uh, UNICEF and that was uh, sp sponsored by, that was implemented by one of the uh, uh, daily based, you know, um, uh, think tanks, right? So, I mean, so once you establish and test it out, you know, then you have a model that can be replicated. You know, you don't uh, do it across the board all the time, I mean, uh, immediately. So I think we'll have to find a way out of this. And we have been in this situation for the last 50 years. Now we have to get out of this. You have to have a parallel system established at a community level so that you know what happens at the national level, which all of us are trying to do, has to be somehow complemented and supplemented by, uh, by, by, by a system at a, at a, at a, at a, at a, at a GN level. I mean, that's the that's unit that we have. And how many officers are there? We can handpick and then you know, form that group. We can, you can call it a community cell. And they'll be basically managing, and it's transparent. Anybody can go and check. You know, you have a computer. I mean, it's not a big deal nowadays. No? Anyway, sorry. Can I, with your permission, just add on one more question? I mean, see, I agree, but then when you give a discretion, so much discretion to these people, you know, for the last 20 odd years, you know, these same people have been misusing the system. I mean, today I saw. Some people's income is over a hundred thousand. They have vehicles at home and they're getting samurdhi. <laughs> right? And and the guy who's checking in the committee is a samurdhi person. Now how can that, you know, sort of yeah. resolve? Because see, objectivity is what we want. Rules are what we want. Discretion must be at the lowest possible. Now the point is, um, uh, Dr. Atnayaka, now, see, six, every 60 year uh, old person is not poor. So you you collect number, you know that is a fact. He's 60 years old. Right? Some are poor, some are rich. But if you're using 30 units of electricity, you are poor. 
there is no way other than to explain your economic uh, status other than either poor or extremely poor. So what I'm saying is the, 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 the use of uh, electricity per month in a household must be, um, this is my, my thinking, I may be wrong, but we can have a discussion, uh, has to be given much more weight than other things that are uh, sort of discretionary and can be, uh, cannot be checked. Now, how can you check how much uh, your income is? How much can you check how much your expenditure is? It is not possible for three people to do that. But the three people can check what the, uh, the, 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 how many units of electricity they use. They can, in a city like mine, you can check what also. So I am continuing to argue that you need to relook at uh, this equal weightage business because that will end up with a wrong selection of people and the committee will not be able to, uh, you know, select the good from the bad. Thank you. Very what I'm saying is the committee cannot verify the data, Dr. Ratnayaka. No, electricity bill is what you can verify. No, once but you, once you get that, and if he's not in, they can check the rest of the data. No, because it's easy. No, you cannot check the income and expenditure data. Why it is there, no? Even if they ask, that's not uh, really taking into in the assessment. Assessment is on material things. I'll, I'll show you if I, I will check. So, so what you're saying is your multi deprivation index. Yes does not take into account income and expenditure? No, we, no. we, we ah. look at wealth on various other indicators. I will send you the report that we... Yes, yeah. It made it to criteria, I think... Uh, coming, we know that they are coming on. Other than that, sir, now, uh, even the vehicle registration, we are asking questions. If they are having a vehicle, three-wheeler, and we, they are not entitled in that, in that criteria. We are trying to verify with the motor traffic department get those information and match with them if they are having all of that just for the verification. If they are given wrong information, even we can still verify with the available data. I checked that, but they are using what, are, what is called open papers. So the three is on open papers. That may be some, some say, yeah, that we can't avoid those. So many difficulties. <laughs> My uncle in Samya uh, gave it to me. This vehicle, that's also his. I mean, they won't. It's obvious because they want to get there. The problem here is more, much more serious. Some people will get 15,000. That is where the problem comes. And others will get 8,000. You see, those who are getting 15,000 will be happy. But those who are drop out, although they have good houses and everything, they will make a lot of noises. We, we, we basically expect this. And uh, can work out uh, a transition arrangement uh, for the time being. I think nothing much to worry, but we, 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 we take that even the, the electricity one that uh, Devarajan and others suggested, they expected an error of more than 10%. We can do that. We, it is already there. We will verify it. You can verify it, no? Ask the board people to verify it and... Uh, we have, I think in Sri Lanka, we have some serious uh, problem of 
of uh, data actually because of that only when we are getting some policy decisions actually it's a problem when it comes to everything actually not only this uh, grassroots level i think even in other some other countries even grassroots level all the data are interconnected so when it come when we go for a, like uh, maybe some uh, identity card number or every thing you can find what is his background and uh, vehicles everything but actually it is very important for us to have that kind of system even in for future years that if we need to have some policies and uh, not even that level but even if we uh, think about the export levels we do exports our exports are remain same uh, all the years but actually even the increase we cannot uh, we cannot get the information whether this money coming into the country or not we are developing the services sector which we can't uh, actually uh, get the correct data I, we don't know we say that it sector is booming and export is increasing but still we don't have way to uh, analyze whether this money is coming to the country or not even the merchandise uh, exports we cannot uh, uh, really track this data so uh, actually we are having a problem of uh, solving these kind of issues before we implement other supportive schemes so whatever it is this is a something national issue uh, so i think that even the poverty issue we we uh, one professor told that we should not approach the uh, bottom level actually it should be top level because if it comes to national level that uh, poverty will uh, vanish w one day because if the national policies are stable that the entrepreneurs and the business friendly environment if we can create you know when it comes to export that lot of exporters are facing lot of barriers because of different departments uh, bureaucracy and uh, they are different uh, uh, legal aspects and all these things so very difficult to get the uh, the business friendly environment for an investor or the exporter so uh, if they can if they can boost automatically their networks they are linked people will boost so it will go down uh, cascade to the bottom level even so that will uh, automatically upgrade the people uh, i mean the livelihood livelihood and their economic situation so uh, this has been already noted that some policy decisions taken during the past without any concerns uh, so that has been affected very highly for the export uh, uh, oriented entrepreneurs you know some entrepreneurs already closed down their operations due to the ad hoc decisions taken some import restrictions because uh, this is a network actually that you know some imports will uh, use for the export processing and there are so many people depend on the, them but uh, sudden decisions taken all the chain will stop so there are so many miserable people now totally stop their sme level people so they might be become the poor people like uh, in the, that's why you said the poverty level has increased so these are very critical areas that i mean when you when you have to take policies decisions it it is it should be very careful something but it is not happening in this country so there should be stable policies that cannot that cannot be changed i mean it has to be updated and changed but totally not the in a destructive manner so the so the my my view is actually this poverty we are addressing the uh, the identifying the people and uh, giving some uh, solutions for them but it should come to the national level solutions that uh, automatically the poverty will disappear because now you know nowadays the it sector has a lot big shortage of uh, professionals for their it industries they are having they can boost it when the when the, there are enough skills but skills are lacking in the country but we have it graduates but they are not matching to the industry so there is uh, th that kind of mismatching in this our i mean uh, industries every everything is like that even the other sectors also same so this this should come from the actually schools education system so uh, but 
but actually we also we i am from export development board we are trying hard to miss, uh, match in these things but edb also does not have a power to uh, change anything you know when we the, you see that uh, the coconut industry is a very good industry that we can develop as a very good industry maybe 1.5 billion industry because we have a very good skill set we have very good value addition everything is there but we we have we have a shortage of nuts but actually it has to be imported from the country where it is available because we can do value addition but we cannot do that because the CRI has some regulations we can't import coconut so then how can we uh, how can we go uh, develop an industry as an industry level. That is why our exports are the same level in the l long time. And also, uh, I, I, another point I want to highlight that non-farm sector, some uh, professor said that we need to con uh, concentrate on the actual industrial sector. Because farming sector, we have only around 20% contribution to the even export. So it, uh, its expansion is very limited. So even though we are going to increase whatever the um, agriculture exports, it is limited because we are not a very big country to do commercial agriculture. It is not happening here actually. Our tra agriculture is still traditional, no efficiency there. Uh, that's why even the potato or the onion, we cannot compete with the other countries. We can import products uh, without culturing here that is, will be cheaper. So then, uh, actually, this is not a sector that we should uh, bore focus, but industrial uh, area that we even for a small component, if we, if we start to do a uh, small component, that can, be a, that can be a big gap of exports. So the, that should be a, actually the higher level uh, commitment that we need to have the uh, connections with the global supply chain that should be a high level discussions that the government should have with the other countries that is uh, that is how the vietnam is going very rapidly go up because they have some uh, bilateral trade with the usa that is how their exports are exponentially increased so that is i just want to i mean uh, emphasize that this should come to the top level uh, decisions and the national policies, not the actually bottom level. Thank you. Thank you very much, madam. Uh, before wrapping up. There's one more question posted online. I think Dr. Lloyd Fernand and Professor Columbage is also online. A question posted to Dr. Ratna uh, It states that kindly educate me how the poverty cutoff rate is determined under the multidimensional poverty measurement that has been uh, gasseted and now applied. Please. Uh, and in addition to economic growth, the country's economic stability in example, low inflation, balance of payments, equilibrium and fiscal balance is equally important in poverty reduction. It's a sort of a statement. Yeah, Dr. Yeah. Now I will first uh, take the uh, cutoff point. Uh, you see this sort of thing, uh, it var poverty varying from one place to the other. We have 330 divisional secretariats. Administratively, you have to proportionately allocate funds to each of the areas because you can't take a flat cutoff point. It varies from place to place. In some areas, poverty is very high. The other areas, like court take, especially Gampa, it's low. And lot of lot number of people are happen to be there in Samudhi because presidents or prime ministers are come from those areas. Everybody are included, so as Ratnapura. Poverty is there. I'm not saying it's not there. But when there are low intensity of uh, interventions like Badul, Monaragala, no one can help them. They go just by the numbers. If the money is available, it goes, but otherwise it's not. For those areas and also the state sector, there will be a proportionate uh, increase in the numbers in those, whereas in urban areas uh, like urban Kalambu, western province, Gampaha, not much of Kalutara. 
there is a severe certain reduction in those areas but proportionally the, the welfare benefits board will work it out and the real poor in the rural areas will get much better benefits than the people in urban areas what we need to do is uh, those who are in transition and also less poor need to get into the system and educate them and take them out of the program those are two year time bound uh, numbers eight, 800000 they know that they shouldn't be there but they they will apply a lot of pressure to be there in the system whatever the money that you get they want to have it that's a prestige so this is one obviously the poverty is linked to the current uh, position that we have in the economy so economic uh, downturn is the one that you are referring central bank cannot release money for the things that we really need we we know the interconnectivity of those sectors that's very important but we cannot take uh, uh, independently we, we cannot help them right now that you see no no country would like to have a negative growth of about 17 percent and uh, it happens so you see now no country wanted to have something like inflation 100 percent so things are improving the numbers that we are coming these are not actual numbers these are control numbers when you open up the economy things will change but the government need to have like in the in the you see i i propose to the uh, government through uh, adb and uh, national planning and others are working to strengthen national planning we need to have a macroeconomic policy not that they determine they will work it out and tell the government this is all what you can uh, spend you can't say that we will buy borrow money from here and there that's where we got into the thing. you see only time that we move out of that system was during Mahavali, all that money, many, much of that money came in as grants of very low level of interest. You can't borrow money at the high level of interest outside the macroeconomic framework and the PIP, and you cannot repay. I mean, this is what really had happened. Everybody knew that, but uh, strengthen it, and government is discussing that to have an independent commission uh, like uh, finance commission and so on with uh, parliamentarians maybe president will be chairing it and endorsing that and the national planning will give the numbers and say this is what we have this is what we can spend so actually that happened but then uh, after 19 2010 we lost it and we started borrowing and we cannot repay and we are not producing uh, for in exchange to repay these loans i mean how much you try mm. look at uh, to repaying uh, th 30 billion official it's about 50 how to repay 50 billion from the the income that we receive unless you generate additional 5 billion a year and restrict some of our imports uh, you all know it's not easy i mean it's a difficult thing but uh, uh, all parties must get together at least for next 10 years to set this and to move the country forward. Country, I'm, I'm sure can we can take it forward, provided that these, uh, the, the, we had this in the FR, but nobody wanted to uh, look at it as a deterrent. And also we have the Fiscal Responsibility Act. Nobody took that as a deterrent. And, and now the worst thing, these are not good in dis discussing, in 2002, we proposed uh, combined revenue uh, authority, that is to get uh, revenue linked customs, in and customs, in and revenue and exactly. excise. Because if you import a car, these all these three institutions affects, and you know where the car is, and the send the uh, the tax department can maintain a file. I mean, you don't just buy a car, no. You investigate and see whether he has the wealth to pay taxes. The system is not there. You have to voluntarily go and declare, and even if you declare, I don't say the rest of the things, we need to develop that computer setup. Even if, the, if it is costly, maybe 10 billion, we have to spend that 10 billion today. Otherwise, you, 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 we actually take a fraction of income what is due to the state. And but we spend as much as we could. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Ratnayaka. Uh, so I think Professor Kolambagi also has posted a question about the SME sector and the uh, interest rates that which is it's detrimental to the uh, to poverty evaluation. So he has just commented on that. Right. Uh, as you said, the EDB, uh, these are these interest rates are unavoidable. Uh, in the macro economy, we know uh, when you uh, trying to raise money. The uh, Treasury bill going rate is the prevailing uh, value of money that comes in the system. So anything lower than that is a problem and the central bank is trying with very many, using many instruments to reduce it. But even this, uh, the couple of, you know that uh, even that was very high it seems. It's about 26%. So it came from, uh, now this is the money that you borrow to run the state. So anything less than that is a difficult thing for the banking setup, how to pay that money thereafter. So it's, it's a complex one. It's a complex one. I think uh, the parliament and the central bank and the government should decide how to do this, maybe increase the money supply. We are not advocates of that. Something has to be done because it will be extremely difficult unless uh, the, the treasury bill rates decline. Uh, anything we cannot do right now. That's the position. Thank you, Dr. Ayat. I think we've run out of time. So on behalf of the Sri Lanka Innovators Forum and the Garmini Korea Foundation, I would like to express our sincere gratitude to all of you who are uh, here who have valuably contributed to this discussion. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to Dr. R. M. K. Ratnayaka for his insight on the on the issues paper on poverty reduction. Dr. Ratnayaka's extensive expertise and experience in the field of development and his comprehensive analysis have provided us with a strong foundation for our discussion today. Uh, as we truly, uh, we are truly honored and privileged to of having Mr. Chandrasen Amali at the. As a chairperson uh, of this session, his wealth of knowledge in socio-economic development have greatly enriched these deliberations. I would also like to express our gratitude to the esteemed panelists, Professor Siri Hettige, Dr. Sunil Navaratna, and Professor Chandra Sena. Your valuable insight, research findings, perspectives has provided us with multi-dimensional multi understanding of the complex challenges of poverty reduction in Sri Lanka. Uh, a special thank goes to our deputy chairman, Doctor uh, of the Garmini Korea Foundation, Dr. Harshat Rupana, for presiding over this event. And uh, I would like to thank uh, our, one of our directors, Dr. Uh, Ambassador uh, Ravinath Arya Singh, also who is present today. Uh, uh, also, I would like to acknowledge the effort of the organizing team, uh, especially uh, our uh, CEO, uh, Lasita Devendra, and the rest of the team for their uh, hard uh, effort and dedication. I would like to thank all those attendees uh, who have uh, actively participated in these sessions uh, on and offline. And in conclusion, uh, the Sri Lankan Innovators Forum is committed to fostering uh, cu a cultural, culture of innovation, research, and dialogue to tackle the challenges of poverty reduction and contribution to sustainable development of our nation. Let us carry forward the insights gained from today's discussion and continue to work together towards innovative solutions that will make a meaningful impact on poverty reduction in Sri Lanka. By fostering collaboration and implementing evidence-based policies, we can strive for a more equitable and prosperous future for all. Your presence and contributions today have taken us one step closer to achieving this goal. Thank you once again for your participation and support. Let us continue to work together towards a prosperous and equitable Sri Lanka. Thank you, sir. And uh, uh, I would like to point out that we would be serving tea and tiffin outside. Thank you very much and have a nice day. Thank you.